Hi everyone, I'm Jack the Rambling Raconteur and I hope that you're doing well. I'd like to discuss the posthumous memoirs of Bras Cubas by Machado de Assis, which is a wonderful book. I absolutely loved it. Uh, it was very, very fun to read. Um, it's an inventive book and it, it's delirious at times. It's a, a short book, uh, fewer than 300 pages, and there are 160 chapters, which gives you an idea of how quickly the, the uh, pace is moving, the plot is moving, the plot such as it is, and the ways in which um, Machado de Assis is using chapter breakdowns to sort of jar us as readers and, you know, shift our attention, shift our mindset. And it's incredibly inventive. The fact that it was written and published in 1881 is astonishing. It would still feel fresh and innovative if it was published in 2021. Uh, and so it, it was a great joy to read. But I want to give a, a sense of just how, how Machado de Assis really is just ready to play from the first sentence. I debated for a time as to whether I ought to open these memoirs at the beginning or at the end. That is, if I would start out with my birth or with my death. Granting that the common practice may be to begin with one's birth, two considerations led me to adopt a different method. The first is that I am not exactly an author recently deceased, but a deceased man recently an author for whom the tomb was another cradle. The second is that this would make the writing wittier and more novel. Moses, who also recounted his own death, did not put it at the commencement, but at the finish, a radical difference between this book and the Pentateuch. And so, shots are fired <laughs> from the first paragraph. Machado de Assis is uh, poking every bear that he can find. Uh, he, he has no, <laughs> no sensibility in terms of who he's worried about, uh, you know, um, teasing or, or poking fun at as a writer. And it's, it just feels very bold, uh, the way he's just jumping in. He's commenting from the voice of Bras Cubas, uh, you know, and, and I think that's an important distinction, but Bras Cubas, uh, within his voice, is commenting on how we think of novels, how we think of memoirs, uh, of which certainly within the 19th century, there were plenty. And the book is acting as a send-up of almost everything. It's a send-up of the 19th century novel. It's a send-up of the realist tradition. It's a uh, send-up of um, all the memoirs from people who thought they were amazing and, and just that their ideas needed to be handed down to posterity, and yet, when considered, were incredible mediocrities. Uh, it's a setup of confessional literature, possibly the building's room. Machado de Assis is just having as much fun as he can, and I think as a reader, I, I was ready to engage and have as much fun as possible with him. But as much as the book is inventive, it's, it's one of those books that gets the... Um, postmodernist before there was any modernism to be post about. Uh, sometimes that's applied to Tristram Shandy from Lawrence Stern, sometimes to, of course, Don Quixote from Cervantes. This book absolutely fits that mold. But like both of those, at its center are these incredibly touching human relationships. As much as I was laughing in almost every chapter, uh, there were also these moments of, of deep humanity, of the, of the um, you know, a book that is joking about death from the first page, when there are deaths within the book, they're brutal. They cut incredibly deep. And we see the, the, the sort of, you know, sacrilegious smirking whimsy that Bras Kubas is projecting out is really just masking the, the deep um, uh, pain that can exist, you know, within human moments. But again, the book is hysterical. So on chapter 84, we have, To a sensitive soul. Among the five or ten people reading me, there is a sensitive soul who is doubtless a bit distressed by the previous chapter, has begun to quake for Eugenia's fate, and perhaps, yes, perhaps deep down may be calling me a cynic. I a cynic? Sensitive soul, by Diana's thigh. That insult ought to be washed away with blood, if blood ever washed away anything in this world. That's a reference. <laughs> no sensitive soul, I am no cynic. I was a man, my brain was a theater in which plays of all genres were staged. Sacred plays, austere dramas, sentimental works, gay comedies, topsy-turvy farces, morality plays, burlesque, pure pandemonium, sensitive soul, a tumult of things and people in which you might see everything. It was host to thoughts of the most various castes and complexions, nor was it the sole province of the eagle and the hummingbird. The slugs and the toad's habitats were represented there as well. Take back those words then, sensitive soul. Give your nerves a shake. Clean off your eyeglasses. Sometimes it's all in the eyeglasses. And let us do away with this thicket flower once and for all. 
ways, as they say in drama, breaking the fourth wall, the ways in which Bras Kubas, and again, I, I like to think of there's a difference between the voice of Bras Kubas in the book and Machado de Assis is the author creating Bras Kubas. Um, and then Bras Kubas isn't necessarily just a mouthpiece for Machado de Assis. But the way in which Bras Kubas is going to break that fourth wall and wants to address the reader directly and intrude on the narrative and comment on our expectations of it are extraordinary. He is, <laughs> as I said, he's delirious. Um, and the book is, of course, functioning in this way of trying to create this everyman, this guy who, who kind of lived the whole life and yet ultimately, you know, what, what life did he live? The, the same question that John Williams Stoner asks. Um, and I think there's a, a way in which the book could almost function as a very deeply cynical and satiric uh, posthumous memoirs of, of William Stoner. But, um, but it's fun and it is strange and it continues. So he has a moment where he recounts the, the death of someone he loved. Um, I, I confess that all this struck me as opaque, incongruous, insane. A sad chapter, let us pass on to another, happier one. The next chapter is entitled, Short But Happy. I was left prostrate, and yet I was at this time a faithful compendium of triviality and presumption. The problem of life and death had never weighed on my brain. Never until that day had I gazed into the abyss of the inexplicable. I lacked that essential thing, that impulse, that vertigo. To tell you the truth, I reflected the opinions of a hairdresser I met in Modena, who distinguished himself by having none whatsoever. <laughs> and so he just is just constantly messing around. And there's a way in which reading this book, um, and certainly if, if anyone who was reading this book in the 1880s, there's a way in which it would have probably felt a bit like being in the audience the first time that suddenly there were characters in Greek drama and not just a chorus, or when a third character was introduced. Um, there, there is this constant innovation at work, and yet it doesn't feel artificial. It doesn't feel as if Machado de Assis is just spinning the wheel and, and then whatever it lands on, he just keeps going. Uh, it does feel that there's a cohesion and a purpose and the final, the final sentence of the book is utterly brutal. And it's not one I'm going to share um, because I want everybody to read this book. It was long um, available in like, uh, I don't want to say poor translations, but translations that didn't quite capture that, that sense of um, urgency, that sense of vitality and voice that Machado de Assis had created here in Bras Cubas. Uh, but, but it's one I want everybody to read. This translation um, from Flora Thompson DeVoe is fantastic. And you don't need to have a deep sense of Brazilian history to understand it. You don't need to have a deep sense of um, Machado de Assis, uh, his biography to understand it. It is just a trip. And there's a lot of ways in which, you know, if you've been reading a bunch of 19th century novels, this feels like a breath of, of fresh air. Now, there's also a sense in which if you regard those as almost like sacred novels, you might despise this book. It feels like, you know, sort of a a, a, a bomb under all of those those uh, realist traditions, the Victorian novels, the 19th century French and, uh, French and Russian novels, that Machado de Assis feels like he's just wants to send them all up. But it, it is a breath of fresh air uh, in my reading and one that I dearly, dearly appreciate. And one that is, I think, going to re -read, uh, reward many, many rereadings. Now, a book like this, of course, inspires just all sorts of connections. First and foremost would be The Life and Opinions of Tristram Shandy Gentleman by Tris, uh, uh, Lawrence Stern, which I mentioned earlier. This is one of my favorite novels, and I think um, Postman's Memoirs of Bras Kubas feels like it, it needs to sit on the shelf right next to this book. Uh, they, are, they are, you know, brothers <laughs> as books or sisters as books. They are so fun. Um, and Machado de Assis actually references Stern explicitly, and, and that seems very evident. He also seems to be toying with um, Confessions. And I think specifically the confessions from Jean-Jacques Rousseau, where this sense of like, I'm going to tell you everything. I'm not going to hold anything back. Like, look at who I really was. That Machado de Assis wants to reveal that there's a great deal of artifice and, and self, self-serving. Uh, there's a very self-serving nature to those types of memoirs. Um, the memoir in general, I think, was, was a great uh, aspect. Machado de Assis creates this character, Bras Cubas, who wants to pretend as if, you know, he's... He somehow, he's telling you the truth and that makes him better than all of his peers. But at the same time, he's a man really without accomplishment, without, uh, he, he's a failure in many ways, in life, in love, in politics. Um, he, he never it really seems to accomplish anything. And I think Machado de Assis is, is commenting on the fact that throughout the previous century, there have been memoirs from every, you know, deputy minister of blank 
in loads of countries. And Machado de Assis is the grandson of people who had been slaves in Brazil at a time when slavery was actually still legal in Brazil, is commenting on the idea that all of these great people who want to write their memoirs about all these great things they did, were most of them were doing it on the backs of people who were enslaved either by law, an unjust law, or uh, by sort of reality in terms of wealth. Uh, the London Journal of James Boswell, though, came to mind as someone else who sort of was trying to have fun and tell the truth at the same time. And, uh, but in terms of the innovation, we get to works, uh, later works, of course, where I think of Luigi Pirandeo with Six Characters in Search of an Author. Really fun play. I might be rereading that, to be perfectly honest. The Stories of Donald Bartlemy. Uh, I don't enjoy these nearly as much as I enjoyed Posthumous Memoirs of Bras Cubas. Hadrian the Seventh, a very strange experimental novel from uh, Fred, Frederick Rolf, who likes the FR to be Father Rolf. Uh, and then much later on, um, Abel and Cain from Gregor von Rosori, again, where there's this sense of the author commenting very explicitly. The fractured nature reminded me of Infinite Jest from David Foster Wallace, or, or many of his works where he has the end notes to sort of force you to jump back. And here we have Machado de Assis like pushing the chapters in. The letters of Charles Lamb uh, were reminiscent, and I believe Machado de Assis was a, a big reader of the letters of Charles Lamb. I was reading some of Lamb's um, letters and essays as I was reading the posthumous memoirs to see if I could note anything that was in there. The epigrams from Marshall <laughs> feel uh, part and parcel of it, especially when um, Bras Kubas comments on being in a cemetery and looking at, looking at the epitaphs, and that an epitaph is, a, in a sense, this one last, like, narcissistic grease, you know, stretch uh, from beyond the grave to try and have a piece for posterity. So it, it was a book that I absolutely loved. Um, Noah and I, from Everyone Who Reads It Must Converse, had talked about it on his life, but I wanted to just get in and, and, and explore a few other ideas. Uh, within this video. So I highly, highly encourage everyone, if possible, to read the posthumous memoirs and have a great week. Thank you.